really, if anyone's going after proposals, you really need to to go back and forth. What are they asking for, and what am I giving them? Um, because that's that's the conversation that takes place when you're you're reviewing proposals. Episode one hundred and twenty nine. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Now, there's one other thing I want to let you know about. If you listen to podcasts, make sure you go subscribe to ArchiSpeak. You can find it on iTunes or visit ArchiSpeakPodcast.com. ArchiSpeak is a casual conversation about all things architecture. Super entertaining podcast with a healthy dose of humor by my three friends, Cormac Phelan, Neil Pan, and Evan Troxell. When you head on over there, let them know you heard about it on Business of Architecture. Today's episode is all about landing your next request for proposal. Today's guest is a facilities project manager with the city of Portland. He's also a licensed architect. And we're going to talk about architecture from the owner's point of view today, talk about the client side of things. And our guest today is going to tell us some tips and strategies for winning your next request for proposal. In today's episode, you will discover the number one secret to winning your next request for proposal, how to give client service more than lip service. As architects, we all like to say that we listen to our clients. We're going to talk about how you can make that, show that through your actions and how that is perceived from the client side. You'll also discover three important considerations when you next write your next RFP response. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's guest. Today, we're joined by Michael Rasika, a young architect. He currently works for the city of Portland in the facilities department as a facilities project manager. Lastly, Michael is the founder and blogger over at youngarchitect.com. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enix Sears, and today we're joined by a special guest today. I'm joined by Michael Rasika. He's a registered architect based in Portland, Oregon, and today we're going to be talking with him uh, a little bit about what he's been up to. He's the author and founder of the Young Architect website. So Young Architect website is a site, Michael, where you share information about how emerging professionals and young architects can pass the ARE. And there's got a lot of other great information on there for young architects, in addition to you yourself being a young architect. So Michael, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think I kind of butchered that introduction. I apologize. I'm kind of out of, uh, I'm maybe out of shape here. I haven't done an interview in over a month. So it's like, you kind of warming me up here. So apologies to our listeners out there. Now, just in case I didn't do you justice, Michael, uh, Michael is an extremely bright guy. He has a, an incredible background working for the facilities department uh, there in Portland. And we're going to talk to him a little bit about what it's like to be on the other side of the table. Because I know as architects, a lot of times it's, I've always wondered, you know, what goes on in the client's mind as they're working with architects, et cetera. So Michael, tell me, give us a little bit of background about about how you came to be a, a licensed architect. And then we'll jump into your, your most recent position with the uh, city of Portland. Yeah. So uh, I grew up on the East coast and um, I went to school at the New York Institute of technology. I graduated in 2007. And uh, while I was in architecture school, I decided I um, got this crazy idea that I wanted to ride my bicycle across the country. And so in 2005, I took a bicycle ride from Virginia to the coast of Oregon. Um, I, was obsessed with cycling the whole time I was in architecture school and I was constantly just riding my bike. And so uh, I did that trip. It was a huge success. I blogged about it. Um, And then I went back to architecture school and finished up my degree. And as I was working on my thesis, my two best friends came to me. I was actually going to hike the Appalachian Trail after college was over. And my two best friends came to me and said, hey, if you wanted to cycle across the country with you, we'd totally go with you. And so I said, all right, done deal. And so we started planning another trip across the country. And then kind of as I was in the middle of my architecture thesis, I kind of came up with this crazy idea of what if I don't come back to the East Coast if I make this a one-way trip? 
And so I bicycled across the U.S. in 2007. Uh, we rode 5,000 miles over the course of 90 days. And then I came to Portland, Oregon. And I'd never been here. I didn't know anyone. And um, I just kind of decided this was my new home. And so my dad FedExed me my portfolio. And I had a job about a, a month or so after I was here. Um, I took a, a position with a small firm. That was in 2007. So it was kind of the, the, at the peak right before the recession started. And so I took this this job. Uh, the firm I was with landed um, previously landed all these big contracts with the city of Portland, with Portland State University. And so as the recession started to unfold, I was actually working like like a maniac on all these city projects and university projects. And I pretty much worked straight through the whole recession. And then as um, those projects were kind of coming to an end, um, stuff started drying up in the office. I did a, I worked on a project for the Parks Bureau. I did, um, I spent two years working on it. They designed a new building um, here in Portland for their maintenance group. And I had spent so much time working on this project that as the Parks Bureau was getting ready to build it, it the project, the bids had came back, they were getting ready to move into construction. Um, someone, one of the project managers from the Parks Bureau said, hey, you've been working on this project for two years. Um, why don't you come over to Parks? They knew that, that uh, I was only, I was at that time underemployed. So I came over and I worked for the Parks Bureau for a year and we oversaw the, I over, helped oversee the construction of that building. Um, and, uh, after that project was over, things were, things were, there wasn't enough work for me in the parks bureau. And so I started looking for another government project management job. That was kind of my first leap into project management. Um, I had always worked as an architectural technician, um, doing drawings, models, and mostly in small firms in the past. But, um, I really kind of fell in love with this managing the project and kind of overseeing everything kind of from the client side. And so uh, I eventually landed another position with the city working in the facilities department and um, which is where I'm currently at now. But um, I've been kind of playing the role as the owner's rep for the past four years rather than being an architect. And what was interesting too is like you said earlier, you always wondered what it would be like. I had the same thought many years before I even got this job. It was actually when I was studying for the architect's exam. I was reading, it was the first exam where you uh, I studied called CDS, Construction Documents and Services, where they really outline the roles and the relationships between the client, the architect, and the builder. And that was kind of where I thought, you know, if I if I could play the role of the owner for a little while, that could be really valuable information as an architect down the road. And then uh, a few years later, this job came along and I've just been, been nurturing it since. You said that you really enjoyed the project management aspect of this. What what is what is it about the project management that got you excited? Well, for me, and previously in the past, I was always doing drawings. I was kind of in the office making things happen. Um, once I kind of stepped into this project management role, I was kind of more overseeing the project rather than doing all the work. I would kind of play the role of making sure all the work gets done. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll have to step in and um, do a drawing here or there or keep things moving along. Um, on all the projects I work on, I always like to do just a little bit of construction work to hammer in a few nails or something. But um, yeah, I, I kind of make sure that the project is moving along in an appropriate manner, and it's a it's going to arrive in the in the in the final destination as a project manager. Okay, and just as an aside, when you said construction work, is that stuff you're doing on the side on your own, or did you do no, some I, some projects? I like to to ha put in a little bit of elbow grease to every single project I work on. Okay, um, I don't know, it's just me. <laughs> Sure, sure. And how did you arrange that? I mean, the construction guys don't like you, don't mind you out there on the site, getting in the way and stuff. It's no big deal if I want to hammer a couple of nails. Gotcha. They're, they're usually pretty cool with it. But <laughs> so, what are some key insights that you had going through that process? Let's talk a little bit about, you know, as you start to experience things from the owner side. What are some of the key realizations you had that threw a different light on your work as an architect? Hmm. Customer service is huge, and um, Something that we had a conversation, um, the police has been one of my biggest clients. I've learned 
so much about the Portland Police Bureau. It's unbelievable. Um, and we had a conversation recently about how a lot of times in government work, um, purchasing, the hiring an architect, a builder, a service or anything is a completely different bureau. So oftentimes the right architect for the job may, there may be many, many barriers to get to that person who you need to work with. Um, there's many rules around purchasing. And frequently um, on the purchasing level, they're looking at many, many things about who gets this work and customer service is frequently overseen. Um, I, as a project manager, that was that's always been my number one um, when working with a firm is how, how good are they with dealing with me, um, working with the client, are they transparent with their billings and um, just very forthcoming and honesty is another thing I really look for. Um, I worked with a couple of firms who at the end of the project said, you know, we didn't use all the fee, so we're not going to bill. And there's an extra couple thousand dollars left of fee. We over we overestimated it. And then I've also worked with firms who just would gobble that money up. But it always went a long way with me when um working with a company that was very, very forthcoming and honest. So honesty and trust. Uh, you said that oftentimes customer service was overseen. Did you mean that uh, the the people who selected the firms, oftentimes that was not a primary criteria, that it was overlooked, that sometimes yeah, you work with it firms? It wasn't just firms. It was builders. It's people that provide services to the city. Um, there, there's many, many ways to get government work. Um, and customer service wasn't, um, it's really hard to figure out. And so one of my biggest challenges is, is understanding who's the people, who are the people that provide good customer service and hanging on to them and keep working with them. Um, in, in a lot of ways, um, I buy into that philosophy that there's many, many people who are qualified to do this type of work, but it's really about who you want to work with, who are, who's fun to work with, who's, it's at the end of the day, it really boils down to personality a lot, a lot of the time. Excellent. And what is, let's dive into what is customer service? Give me some examples of what does it mean to have good customer service? Um, from an, in my relationship with architects, uh, good customer service to me is in a way being two steps ahead of me. Um, giving me updates on where they're at regularly without me asking for it, um, bring, getting their payments on time, um, double checking the math, making sure there's um, having a very tight set of drawings, tight set of invoices, um, working well with the client, being patient. But one of the biggest things about doing government work is there's a ton of paperwork and the decision-making process is very, very frequently convoluted. And um, sometimes as a project manager, to get the decision made, you really just have to wait it out and let it bounce around a few times. And I see that, but oftentimes the consultants are left in the dark and um, I convey that, but frequently the projects, projects get held up due to the decision-making process, which is in a way almost out of everyone's hands. Um, so it's just a matter of just being patient and um, realizing that things move a little bit slower in the government than they do on the private side. Can you give me an example of a firm you worked with that didn't have, or maybe their customer service wasn't up to the level that you would have liked and what it was like for you to work with them and some of the frustrations you had? Yeah, I worked with, a, there's been a few. Um, one of my biggest frustrations I had in one project was just a really sloppy set of drawings. Um, the, I, I love to redline drawings as an architect. I like to redline my own. I like to redline other people's. And I like it when other people redline mine. But um, I ended up taking over a project that had already been bid. And it was really my job to carry through this through CA, but just very a lot of sloppy errors. Um, the, the architect had done a, a lot of private work, but wasn't very familiar with putting together a set of drawings for a low bid project. Um, and so there was a lot of ambiguities and just a lot of, it created a lot of 
discussion intention during the project with kind of ironing out what the intention was, but it doesn't say that on the drawings, but how are they supposed to bid it? And then at the end of the day, the owner pays for it, but we should have paid for it in a bid. Um, so that was kind of one of the big ones. Um, yep. And stop in on that for a second. Uh, are you talking about details, not details being left out, some stuff not being shown, specifications not being tight enough? Yeah, details being left out. Yeah, exactly. Um, there was an error on a door schedule, um, which became very costly. Tell me about um, that. There was, um, they left off one of the um, the painting codes on on the door schedule, and apparent we ended up having to add in um, more more doors that needed to be painted. Um, like there were twenty extra doors that needed to be painted by one small error on a on a paint schedule that, so that tra it just translated to a big construction error so, so perhaps the the contractor looked at it and said hey there's this this paint code here for these 20 doors but i don't see that it's in the schedule anywhere this paint isn't called out you know there's no information here about the paint exactly and really at the end of the day when when an architect's doing a set of drawings for a public low bid job they they really need to be obsessive about um calling everything out and putting more notes on the drawings to just to be clear. And I don't know, the way I was trained to always do construction drawings, it was you would answer the, you would give the information, but the minimum and um, extra dimensions and things like that. For Especially for public low bid jobs, it really helps these guys. Um, just, just more information is better on this type of work as far as the documents go. Okay. So those are, that's a good example of... Uh you know, drawing set that wasn't put together well, that had some holes in it. Let's talk about a firm that you worked with that just really, you were just, you'd be happy to work with them again. And they, you were impressed. Anyone that you were really impressed with, you said, wow, this firm has their stuff together and it's just a pleasure to work with them. Yeah, it was, um, and I want to add one more last thing to uh, something I don't like about uh, a firm that I didn't work well with. It's uh, when I feel like when I ask them, to do something that might be a little bit outside of the scope, um, knowing that they won't extend a little bit farther without creeping into additional services. And I don't mind giving additional services to people, but I also need them to, you know, it's a give and take. It's a, it's a little bit of a, sometimes I need people to bend over and um, often if they weren't able to flex just a little bit, I would end up kind of picking up the slack sometimes. So that was just another thing. But a firm that I've worked and how, really how well common with, is that? Was was it pretty common to find firms really. that would say, "Hey, that's an additional service"? Are um, most people flexible? Yes and no. Um, I think it goes across. It, it's really about learning who you who you're working with. Um, and uh, some firms, yeah, wouldn't wouldn't move do anything extra, and then others put gave it a lot of extra time and energy. And um, I I. I've always believed everyone should be compensated for their time. Um, but sometimes I need just a, an extra drawing or something um, that is, might be outside of their scope. So um, it's just kind of painful sometimes when you get nickeled and dimed. Do you have an example that comes to mind of something, uh, an extra drawing? What kind of drawing are we talking about here? Maybe a clarification through an RFI yeah. or... A a clarification or the, the city say projects under construction. This is just an example. I'm yep. not even thinking anything specific. Um, we want to get some furniture drawings done. We need CAD, more CAD files. Um, I may need, may need the architect to do an additional uh, revision to one drawing, but I'm really gathering information so I can give, so I can hire another consultant. I could see an architect just being like, you know, um, all right, that's going to cost you. Um, I'm giving me a hard time about it, but um, it's really whenever I need, I always try to get everyone on board on the same train to take this thing to the to the end. And um, it, it didn't happen that frequently, but um, it, things do pop up. Yeah, well, I know, and Scope Creek is a real, very real concern for architecture yeah. firms. You know, a lot of times they're they're very much under the gun in terms of uh, cash flow. You know, in terms of maybe not having the profit that they'd like, and any any sort of Scope Creek with projects can totally destroy their their margins on a project. 
So, yeah. you know, how, how do you balance that as a, as a client, having that understanding? How do you, how do you balance that, that need for additional services with the flexibility you're talking about? I completely agree. And, uh, I think everyone should be compensated and, um, I'm never trying to get anything free from anyone, but, um, yeah, scope creep's huge. And, um, that's always something, even on my end as a project manager, we're always, I, that's kind of like my big job. It's really figuring out what this project is, dialing it in, writing out the scope and ending it at that. Um, people constantly want to add things and change things. And that's why the, the role of the, my job exists. It's because I'm the middleman between, I do a lot for the police. So it's on the middleman between the police officers and talking to the design team. And um, it has to go through me first. And frequently I, I need to talk to the client first to see what they really need, because maybe there's a way to achieve that with another means and not using the architect and the construction budget. Um, maybe there's another avenue we could go down. Um, it's kind of I guess this job's really about me understanding all the rules and how it works and the roles of every person. All right, let's talk about the flip side about your experience yeah. working with firms that really excelled and you thought had that customer service. Um, there's been a lot of them. There's been a lot more than the ones that are the opposite. That's good. Um, I don't know. Really good set of drawings, really, edu you know, I'm not an expert in every type of, uh, Let's just use roofing, for example. Um, I've done a couple of roofs and I know roofing, but I don't know detailing and flashing. Uh, it's, it's a, that's a specialty. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to work with architects who have the specialties that I haven't had and to be able to rely on them to go the extra mile and um, get the right material, get the drawings done right. Um, I mentioned being patient earlier. That's been something that's been super huge and understanding that sometimes the architect, it takes forever for anything to happen on the city and sometimes payments. One, one thing I started doing on all of my projects, which not a lot of other project managers do is frequently it's harder to, um, the first payment is always the toughest because there's a, a million things you got to set up. So I would always have every architect, uh, contractor, whatever, just, I'd say, just bill me a uh, hundred dollars. Um, and I want to push this th thing through. So we'll get the pipeline started. And just so after that's set up, it's going to take a while, but after that's set up, the, the flow of money will move. And so I always tried to do a, a payment right in the beginning, but oftentimes doing government work, uh, consultants and contractors may have to wait several months to get paid. And there's nothing you can do about it. Um, it sucks, but um, it happens quite a bit, especially to fall, small firms. I mean, it's a big deal when the city of Portland owes you $15,000 and you have to wait three months to collect that money. Um, so a big part of my job too is making sure that didn't happen and knowing the rules and the systems and making sure that everyone got paid on time. What can an architect do in, in that situation where they're owed money by a public entity or a client perhaps. And it's not, it's not that the client doesn't want to pay. It's just perhaps that there's some, some red tape or some rules and regulations, a process that needs to happen. What could an architect do to speed that up? Um, the best thing they could do is be patient and um, not, and to just understand uh, when there's, there's nothing I can do. And by getting angry about it doesn't help the situation. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's uh that's kind of my only answer. I hate to say it, but um yeah, there's a lot of red tape that goes in and being patient and friendly about it and getting an explanation as to why. Um what would typically happen is say that uh there'd be additional services, it would have to get approved by city council, maybe the mayor's got to look at it or something and it's just procedure. But a big part of government pro work it prides itself on process and procedure and it doesn't make sense um in the private private world but it's process is huge and we have to go through the process yep no i i i understand i think our listeners understand too you know some of our listeners do residential work a lot of them have do the public kind of work and 
you know, you said that you also were involved in the RFP process. Yeah. Tell me about it's your involvement in RFPs. First of all, tell me the scope of what you did. And then I'd like to jump into some insights on that. So first off, <clears throat> before I started working for the city, I worked for a small firm here in town and um, I got would get pulled into their RFP process, um, helping them create proposals and put together portfolio work and kind of they're always chasing after government contracts. And so I got to be on the private side of this a little bit. I learned InDesign. I learned marketing and writing and kind of crafting these things and um, reading through. And being on that side of it, what I really learned was that the firm had done so many of these proposals and they really had a portfolio um, of previous work they did. It was really about plugging in pieces from other parts and then kind of overseeing it as one cohesive whole. Um, so I was really vet, um, glad to have experience kind of when I came over to the city and started to get asked to help review architectural, I did architectural interiors and landscape proposals. Um, so I get asked to review these proposals and everyone has a different way of reviewing them. The city, the government rule, they give you rules on how it's done um, and how you're supposed to follow it. But every person has their own means and methods on how they enjoy reading this. Some people read every proposal from cover to cover uh, in one shot. Other people break them up. They do three at a time or two at a time. Um, what I used to do and I was um, look at what the question is in the piece of the proposal on all of them all at the same time and then move to the next piece. And I essentially batched it all together. Um, but yeah, then it's really about understanding that everyone reads these things differently um, may inform how you put your proposal together. Um, when you batch it all together, I'm not comparing them to each other. I'm comparing it to how you answered the question and I'm going back and forth. What was, what was asked of you on this proposal and what are you giving me? Um, that's essentially how I reviewed all of them. And I, I would create my own grading system, say, um, this one question, say there was X amount of points to say there's 25 points to award in this one area. Um, but this area asks for five different things. I might give every one of those five things, five points, or I may decide one of them's kind of silly. And um, so I'll give, I'll, I'll award more points to another criteria that I think is more important. Um, and so that was kind of one thing I always did, but it's really, if anyone's going after proposals, you really need to, to go back and forth. What are they asking for? And what am I giving them? Um, because that's, that's the conversation that takes place when you're, you're reviewing proposals. Okay. So in addition to answering the questions very specifically and providing the information that's required, what other things would you say owners or clients are looking for that you found in your experiences or looking at these RFPs, you know, who are the firms that, that won them and mm -hmm. is there any commonalities in the criteria or the things you saw that made them win those proposals? Yeah. Um, it was, and I'm going to go back to what I just said too. It's about very specifically answering the question. Um, and even it did very, a lot of times I, I would read proposals and I could sp see that they spent a ton of time writing this stuff. Um, but it doesn't really answer the question and it confuses me or, um, and points would get lost. It's about one thing to consider too, is what's, what are you going after? What, is there a specific project or is it just kind of a flexible services contract? The city frequently has people on call that they, um, call up when they need, uh, an architect or an engineer. So it's kind of like, what's the, what's the criteria? If it's more of a project based, um, all of the work you need to talk about needs to be aligned with uh, what that project is. Um, government doing doing a government project, a lot of a lot of architects and engineers um, who have never worked with the government before don't um, under may not know that it takes forever to get a decision. 
And so one thing I always look for as well is has this has this consultant worked with a government agency before? Um, do they have that experience? Do they understand how the city works? Um, that was always huge to me as well. And so seeing other government projects and the other agencies, counties, state state projects always um, always jumped out at me and were really valuable on those types of proposals. Okay, so there's the the fact that they worked with the you know city before. They understand how to work with public entity. Were there any other things in general besides just answering the question? I mean, how how big was experience? How big was a creative approach to the problem? How big was a, I mean, let's just go down the list. The other things that, you know, a lot of times you'll see are, you know, a certain percentage of, you know, what's your change order percentage and what's your, you know, past references, you know, kind of what, what were the, if you were sitting down if you were teaching a class on, you know, this is what you should do if you want to try to win projects with the city, mm -hmm. give me that spiel. What would that look like? Um, In addition to what you already told us, which is yeah, yeah. answering. So, um, a project approach is another piece. It's a huge piece of it. Um, what's your approach? Um, have you looked at the schedule? There's usually a ton of information that comes from the, when they ask, they solicit the RFPs. How that information is gold. If you can take that information, translate it through your business and give it back to us as your approach, um, that's super helpful. And using the, uh, talking about how our schedule ties into your schedule, taking it verbatim. I've also seen architects literally copy and paste onto their proposal, what was written in the cities and that hasn't gone over very well. Um, but yeah, if you could take how your business works and process through our project and give it back to us, um, that's been super, super valuable. Can you give me a hypothetical example of what that would look like? Um, so say with the RFP goes out and it gives kind of a, a, a schedule and says this project is going to go through schematic, um, DD, CD, CA, um, and may or may not, depending on how much information it would have, um, what it would be great to see back is an architect say, okay, so during CA or during SD, this is what our phase looks like. Maybe we have a meeting, uh, an initial meeting. We work for a little while. We get together. We have another meeting. Then um, we have a, a sign off. You sign, maybe sign our documents. Um, we're moving into the next phase and very uh, break down into pieces what, what you're getting um, and very, paint a realistic picture on what it is um, with actionable items. That's super helpful. And um, there's been times when I've reviewed proposals where it's very just kind of their approach is very, um, I don't know, it's, it's not a lot of detail there. I always, I always resonated with a lot of detail and understanding that there's a, you have systems in place and this is how you do work in your office and um, it's going to go through this process. Now, I've been to pre-proposal meetings where the architects walk out, you know, we're always talking amongst ourselves, like, what do you think about that? You know, whatever, whatever. And I've been in ones where people are like, wow, that, that schedule is totally unrealistic. I mean, the city, they say this, they want this done. They need it done in 18 months. And yeah. they're asking us what our fee is going to be. You know, that puts architects in a really tight spot projecting out, especially when the scope isn't clear. If there's, you know, there's mm -hmm. always going to be the things that you just can't, you can't, there's always that question mark of what is it actually going to be like? You know, what would you yeah. say um, to architects that find themselves in that situation where they feel like they're being asked to meet a, a schedule that they can't meet or that they feel is real unrealistic? So say from their uh, professional experience, they feel that it's an unrealistic schedule and that the client, the city or whoever the client is, is liable for problems and they're going to get burned because they're pushing for something that's too aggressive. So as a proposal, someone giving a proposal, there's always the pressure yeah. to try to please the client and try to say, oh, yeah, we can do it in that amount of time when you really feel like the honest thing to do is to say, we would love to try to meet that schedule, but based on our past experience, this is how long this takes and this is why. What's the tactful way to approach that? And how is that perceived from the client side? 
there's always opportunities to ask questions and to keep the conversation going before you turn the proposal in. I mean, while you're working on it, you can ask questions. And so my advice would be, if that situation occurs, to reach out to the to the purchasing person that you're working with, who's who's put out this RFP, and to express your concerns and to really ask more questions and get more information. Um, have that conversation. Have that as a conversation before you turn in a proposal. Um, that's a great opportunity too. Uh, when that happens, it really forces this the city to take a step back and review and see if this is a valid concern and um, if they need to provide more information. The the city would do that. Um, and one thing I I don't know if other government agencies do this. I know the city of Portland does it. Is um, you're allowed to the architects are allowed to review the other proposals after the process is over. Um, that is super valuable. Mm. Um, it'd be, it would be worth, and I think you have to actually go down to the office and they'll give you all the papers. But um, I would recommend, you know, if you're not winning these things or coming close or understanding why you want them to really go down to the office and read, figure out which ones did win. Um, and then you had asked earlier too, is there a theme that I saw but got kind of going between them? Um, I think... The theme that I always saw was the clarity in the proposals. Um, it was always very quick, very quickly as a reviewer could I see the question, see what was being asked and get a, an answer that that was suitable. Um, it was always about clarity for me. Um, I saw that in all the proposals that won. They were um they knew how to answer the questions. They knew how to, to tell the city what they were looking for. And they had a, a track record to show it. Um, that was really the most kind of the theme that I saw going. And can you give me an example of what you mean by clarity? Um, yeah, it was, um, you know, sh show us five projects that are um, would be relevant to this to this um, proposal you're going after. And very quickly, I could see, you know, those fire projects are, wow, very similar to what we're doing. They're government projects. Um, I'd be impressed by the work. And um, there wasn't too much information, but it didn't leave me needing more. Um, it just was very straight to the point. Excellent. Well, Michael, thanks for diving into that with us, talking a little bit about your position there that you your last position actually which was you know as the facilities project manager there for the city of portland very interesting appreciate it and look forward to jumping into the next episode talking about what's happening now and what's yeah. what's going on cool and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture to get more resources about how you as an architect can run a rewarding business that is both fun flexible and profitable visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the join button to claim your free account to business of architecture insider as a member you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients start a new firm and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.